Good evening. Welcome to our evening services at Central. I'm so glad that you're joining us this evening. We're going to be having a study from God's Word. Before we get into that, we'll be having a prayer and then some songs. Are you ready? You were despised. You were rejected, Lord, those who passed by. Even averted their gaze from the side. Such was the suffering you bore for us. Led like a lamb, a lamb to the slaughter, you spoke not a word, but chose to be silent, though you did no wrong, nor was deceitfulness found in you. Yet by your wounds our salvation has come, yet by your suffering Freedom is one. For God has highly exalted your name. He has enthroned you on high. Jesus, the name of all names. God has highly exalted your name. He has enthroned you on high, Jesus, the name above all names. You were despised, you were rejected, Lord, those who passed by, even averted their gaze from the side. Such was the suffering you bore for us. chose to be silent, though you did no wrong, nor was deceitfulness found in you. Yet by your wounds our salvation has come, yet by your suffering our freedom is won. For God has highly exalted your name, he has enthroned you on high, Jesus, the name above all names. God has highly exalted your name. He has enthroned you on high, Jesus, the name above all names. You were despised. You were rejected, Lord, those who passed by, even averted their gaze from the side. Such was the suffering you bore for us. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for this life that you have given us. We thank you for the world that you created for us to live in. We thank you for our homes, and we thank you for our families. We thank you for all the monetary blessings that you pour out so richly on us each and every day, things that we don't deserve, many things that we take for granted. So we thank you for all of these things. As we reflect on the things that we're thankful for, Father, help us to direct our minds each and every day to, to the greatest gift that you gave us, which was your son and the reconciliation reconciliation work that he did on the cross for us to bring us back into a relationship with you. Help us to remember the sacrifice that he made on our behalf, the pain that he endured on the cross, the sins that he took upon himself that were not his, they were ours. We deserved to be scrutinized by you to endure your righteous wrath against us, but it got redirected on him. So as we think about all of these things, we're especially thankful for Jesus Christ, your son, who did that work for us. Father, we pray for all of those that are part of the central congregation that are not able to, to be here, that are sick, that have their own struggles and their worries. We're mindful of, of the pain that they are enduring. We ask that you, you be with them, you put your hand on them, you give them the comfort and the peace that they need. Father, we pray for those that are in our military, 
Uh, we pray for the leaders of this land, that the things that are set before them, the direction of this country, be things that they will be mindful of as far as uh, you as the moral authority and the, the executive decisions they make would, would be kept in the realm of you as that moral authority. Father, please forgive us when we fall short. We know we continue to sin each day as we strive to, to be more like your son. So please forgive us when we don't measure up. Father, thank you for everything else in this life, what's left of it that we have to live, and we ask that you give us the strength and the courage to lead the life, the remainder of our days in service to you, always looking for opportunities to talk to other people who do not know about the joy that is within us as Christians and the salvation and the hope that they have when they accept your Son as their Lord and Savior. We pray all these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining me once again as we continue another study on encounters with Jesus. We're studying through the Gospels, and today we're looking at Matthew chapter 8, two different situations where a leper is encountering Jesus and also discussion about a servant with a centurion. Let's start in Matthew 8, verses 1 through 4. This is what Matthew writes. Now, when he'd come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you could make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, Be sure or see that you tell no one, but go on your way and show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Leprosy, very uncommon thing we would find in our country in the United States today. It was not uncommon back then. Matter of fact, there's a whole lot said in the Old Testament about leprosy and the importance of making sure that one stays away from people who have leprosy. Today, we understand that not all leprosy is contagious like the part that's described in the Old Testament. But from the description that's given to, to us in the Old Testament, we find that God is preserving his people by making sure that anyone who contacts leprosy never gets around other people who don't have that problem lest they catch the disease also. Very contagious very debilitating. In addition to that, it also eventually destroys the individual piece by piece on the body, eating away the flesh of the individual. Leprosy is a terrible disease to have. And as we would look at that in times past, we would capture a glimpse of, oh, that must be bad to have leprosy. But I think after our COVID circumstances that have come upon us over the last year, and the fact that people have isolated themselves or quarantined themselves in their homes, fearful of contacting the COVID disease, fearful some who have it of giving it or spreading it to other people. So we have lived a life uh, similar to the leper over the last year, not getting out and being with friends, not being with family, and especially not getting close to anyone, not touching anyone. Oh, how we have missed handshakes when we come to church, or hugs from people that we so desperately miss. A lot of people have missed graduations because of COVID, have missed visiting with grandparents because of COVID, have been missed the opportunities of being with individuals who might be going through surgery and other tight situations because of the COVID situation and being fearful of contacting the COVID disease. Understandably, we say, we know what that's like. I think by seeing that and having experienced that for one year or a little more, we've had a glimpse of what the leprosy was like and what those people were going through. The people who had leprosy not only had a problem for a year or two, but they were contaminated or quarantined away from everybody else. They lived in isolation. 
They weren't allowed to get near anybody. Everybody else pretty much cut them off. They never had the friendly touch of family and fellow human beings, except for maybe one another who might be living in some place isolated together, lepers, but apart from everybody else that they're so used to being at. They missed birthday parties, anniversaries, special holidays, or just the normal sit down at a meal and be there with a the family occasions. They so desperately needed human contact. You know, a lot is being said, matter of fact, about that very thing. I looked on the internet just to do a little bit of examining about what this idea was for us as far as COVID. It says this, the word quarantine was first used in Venice, Italy in 1127 with regards to leprosy as it was widely used in a response to the Black Death, although it was not until the year 300 or 300 years later that it actually took place in UK. So the idea of being quarantined, the Black Death situation, uh, bringing some things about, has been something that's been going around for a thousand years. But that feeling of leprosy was something that was just extremely awful for the individual. As we said, isolated from their families, not being able to participate in any activities that any one of us would normally do. The great need of companionship and friendship and sharing with one another was totally left out of an individual's life. Now think about that as we look back at the story here. Jesus comes down from the mountain. He's been in Matthew's chapter 5, 6, and 7 on a mountain, delivering what I think is usually described as the Sermon on the Mount, but sometimes I think it's a series of lessons that Jesus gives. So he comes down from the mountain, and immediately, as the great multitudes are around him, a leper comes nearby. Now, you have to remember that the leper keeps his distance as required by the Old Testament law. He shouts out from a distance and maybe covers his face and yells out, unclean, unclean. And yet this leper wanted to get close enough to Jesus to communicate. How close was he? I don't know. Scripture doesn't really indicate that. But I'd say he's respecting the Old Testament law of maintaining that social distancing, as we call it, but it was definitely an Old Testament command of keeping distance. He knows that he's not allowed to do that. But as he approaches Jesus, he makes this comment, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Some people have read into that, well, Lord, if you could do that, like maybe you can, maybe you can't. But I think it's more along the lines of, Lord, I know that you can do this. If you're really willing, if you want to do this, you can do this. And that's what I perceive is in the mind of the Pharisee, or the leper, rather. As he approaches Jesus, he has already seen the power of Jesus demonstrated somewhere before the Sermon on the Mount. He's heard of miraculous things to, that Jesus has performed, and he knows if anything want, that Jesus wants to do, he can do it. He sees that Jesus has the power. His question is, is Jesus willing to? Maybe he's in his mind asking himself, do I have this leprosy because I've been a sinful person? And it was quite well understood in that day and time, and even today's time, that a lot of times when someone is totally disabled with some kind of disease or some other grave problem, they think that God is striking them because of some sin in their life. And people will draw the conclusion sometimes about others, and they'll see something and think, oh, I wonder what they did that God's striking them down. The friends that Job had came to Job, matter of fact, in the Old Testament, and they came to him watching Job in his misery and determined that Job must have some great sin. Well, he did not, and that was a demonstration from God that that's not the reason that everybody has disease. But as this man is approaching Jesus, he knows he doesn't demand or even deserve his presence because of his sinful life and because of his leprosy. So, Lord, I'm not sure I could really get in your presence, but if you're willing, could you hear me out? If you're willing, I know you can do this. So I don't really think 
he's questioning Jesus' power. I think rather he's demonstrating he is fully aware that Jesus has the power. It's the question of, with all the things that may have happened in this leper's life, he's wondering, does God really think I'm worthy of this? I think that's sometimes how we are. God, am I really worthy of your attention? If I bow my head and pray, are you really listening? Am I worthy of that? Because I'm just some old leper, as this person would have thought. I don't really deserve your attention or the answer to your prayers, but if you're willing, <clears throat> God, I know you could. And so there's a bit of a challenge here for us to identify with where this leper is because in some respects we are unclean, unworthy of Jesus' attention. And yet Jesus fully gives it. He responds to the leper by doing this. And I want you to notice the two things that he does. The first thing he does is touch him. It says that Jesus put out his hand and touched him. Now, if you're marking your Bibles, as I've said before, this is a point to highlight, just the word touched. I have it circled in my, in my Bible here because I want to remember as sinful as I am and how much I don't deserve God's attention that he cares enough to reach out and touch me. He does this, Jesus does, before he cleanses the leper. You know, if we had some old mangy dog that came up to us and you wanted to pet it because it just needed a little attention, the first thing you want to do is scrub it clean, and then maybe you'll pet it, you see? But Jesus does just the opposite. He saw that there was a grave matter of importance that that fellow had been missing in his life for however long he'd been a leper, perhaps many years, without the personal touch of someone that cared. And so before he even cleansed the leper, he reaches out and touches him. I don't think he just slightly touched his fingertip. Matthew doesn't indicate exactly what happened. But did he put his arm around him? Did he give him a hug? Did he put his hand on his shoulder? Whatever it was, it was the first human contact of a clean person that that man had had in a long time. Someone who was of clean nature, someone who was so close to God, was so willing to reach out and touch him. There's songs even said about reach out and touch someone. There's commercials that have been said that. I'm right here, one commercial says. This is what Jesus is demonstrating as he reaches out to this person. And so he reaches out and touches him. And then he does cleanse him. Because here we're understanding that Jesus is demonstrating not just to the leper, but to his apostles and to all the multitude that's watching, I have the power. Not like I'm some great thing, although Jesus is but rather he's demonstrating that God is with me. That is a proof for all the lessons that he just delivered. Maybe some people are coming down from that mountain and they're thinking about that. And you remember as Matthew closes out what Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount and he challenges people to remember uh, about God all of the things that, that we had in life, especially with the idea of building your house on the rock, that foundation, which is Jesus Christ, which is his scriptures. How far do you trust Jesus? Can you really think that he can do those kind of things? Well, the answer is yes. I'll show you by how much power God delivers through me to cleanse this individual, to demonstrate that I'm speaking for God, and this is what he does. So all the people that were maybe watching the lessons and hearing what was going on now say, yeah, I, I really should believe what he says because God's talking through him. He's not just some ordinary philosopher or educated person or some wise individual. God is using him, and it must be true what he's saying. So he performs a miracle and demonstrates that, and the person is cleansed. <clears throat> But he's also teaching, I think, to his apostles and to us, if we're paying attention, that we're here not only to take care of spiritual matters, but emotional matters in that person's life. 
And the first thing he wanted to do was touch him, just to, to reach out and say, there's, there's some love in my life. I care for you. I realize what's needed in your life. And oh, how important that is for us. When we're striving to help some individual to remember at the very core what's hurting inside them and try to analyze that to a kind and gentle way, what can I do to soften that individual? What can I do to open a heart that God's word could penetrate? So before Jesus tells the man he's cleansed and sends him as the command would come from Moses in the Old Testament to go see the priest, he demonstrates care by touching him. Then he performs a miracle, cleanses him. So Jesus is dealing with three aspects in that person's life. First of all, his emotions or his heart. Second of all, his physical needs. And then third of all, by sending him to the priest, he's dealing with the spiritual commands that God would have him fulfill. Those are things that we need to think about just as we're looking at that because Jesus is our example. He becomes our model for us of how to help individuals. We look at what's hurting in their life because everyone has something that's troubling them. We look at the possibility of what can I do with my abilities to help that person to touch his life and then to bring into perspective at the right time what does God's word say and how that can help that individual to be spiritually taken care of also. So that's a bit of story here about this, how Jesus in this event is demonstrating to the man his power and his love and to all of us who follow him to say, this is a good way to live in reaching people with Jesus. Moving on to the next part, begin in verse 5 here. There's a story about a centurion now and a servant that he has. So let's look at verse 5. <clears throat> now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I'll come and heal him. But the centurion answered and said, But Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. Just only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And I say to another one, come, and he comes. And to my servant, I'll say, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled. And then he said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you that I have not found such a great faith, not even in Israel. And to say to you that many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into utter, outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. I imagine the centurion was quite rejoicing in the whole process, but I, I want you to notice a few things. First of all, Jesus is talking to a centurion that approaches him. He doesn't come up to the centurion, but the centurion felt like he could come in the presence of Jesus and be accepted. Remember now, the centurion is not of a Jewish background. He's a Roman citizen of a tough characteristic as a, a centurion is. A centurion is a leader or a commander of a hundred men, like a captain of an army. You got to be rugged to deal with army men. And so I imagine he did have a gentle personality in talking to Jesus, but a life of, of ruggedness and toughness. But yet he comes to Jesus in a kind way, and it says he pleads with him. Now I want you to notice that this man is a powerful individual. He's grown up in the ranks to become a centurion. He's tough. He's rugged. He calls commands out. These people obey him. He's talked about those things. We'll come back to that in a second. But here is the soft nature of the individual. And he changes and he looks at Jesus very humbly. And he pleads with him. 
I also want you to notice what he pleads for. He's pleading for his servant because he's dreadfully tormented. I would bet that in that day and time, servants really didn't have a lot of value other than money value to an individual. And yet when he comes to Jesus on behalf of his servant, he's coming because he cares for the servant. He cares that he's dreadfully tormented. I want you to notice the position of the servant. The man doesn't come and say, Jesus, I got this servant that can't work right now. I'm really losing a lot of money over him. I need him to be fixed. He comes to him because the centurion is hurting inside for the pain that his servant is going through. That's genuine empathy that we need to have as a Christian. Jesus saw that in the individual and he's quite impressed, although he wasn't of Jewish background. And remember that Jesus is sent, first of all, to what he calls the lost sheep of Israel, to the Jewish nation. Once in a while, you'll see in the Gospels, he gives some attention to people who aren't of Jewish background, as in this case. Normally not so. But the centurion comes to him, and I imagine the people are a bit astounded that Jesus is going to stop and take time for him. But he does so because he knows the value of the lesson that's going to take place here. I think he already sees in the heart of the individual what's about to happen. And he's going to use this moment to demonstrate faith even to an individual that's, or of an individual that's outside of the Jewish background of faith in Jesus, who many of them did not have. So the centurion comes and pleads with Jesus. He cares about his servant. When Jesus says, I will come and heal him, the man's response again is of a humble background. It's not that he's too busy to have Jesus come, but he says, I'm not worthy that you should come. I don't deserve that you come to my house. But the man already had in his mind what Jesus was capable of doing. I'm not worthy you to come to my house or come under my roof, literally what he's saying, but the point is to my home, just speak a word. Not a whole grand finale of different words, but just speak a word, and the miracle would be performed. So I want you to see what's happening here because as he's talking about this, he's recognizing that Jesus has such a tremendous power that he can perform a miracle even though he's not present with the guy. And that as he's looking at the centurion, he sees what's inside the centurion's heart. As the man says, I'm a man under authority. In other words, I've got Caesar over me, but I have authority and I can command people under me. He's looking at Jesus and saying, I see that there's a great authority over you that's given to you to pass on to other people. And if you call out a word or a command, it happens just because of who you are. So if you got your Bibles out again and you underline things, underline the word authority here. Because this captain or this centurion understood authority from the Roman army and the power he had that was given to him. And he saw in Jesus that type of authority from God Almighty. Authority that God gave him that he could do anything he wanted to do to the point of healing from a distance. You know, sometimes people wonder, what is Jesus capable of? I anything he chooses to do. He doesn't have to be present in order to heal you, to take care of you. Although I'm very much comforted by the fact that he says, lo, I'm with you always. He's never left our side in that respect. But he can do anything he wants at a distance. And the centurion saw that. He didn't have to have Jesus come and lay his hands on the person or anoint him with oil or do anything special. Matter of fact, if you think about it, he didn't even ask, where do you live? The centurion didn't stop and say, you know, I live in this house over here down on this street and it's this color house. And he just said, you just say the word and I know it'll be done. That you know who it is that needs it. You know how he's connected to me and you can do all that by one word. Now, there's nobody on earth that can do that. On earth, they can do that. Outside of that, of course, Jesus can. Sometimes when we're praying for people, we have to understand that God can go anywhere and do anything. 
We can pray for our missionaries and know that God will take care of those things. We can pray for our loved ones, even though they may not be present with us. We can pray a lot and we can pray often and we can know that whoever God is, he can do what he thinks is important in taking care of that. So the centurion has that kind of faith. I don't deserve it, Lord. I don't, don't deserve your attention and you're giving it to me. Just say a word and I know it's going to happen as sure as when I call out commands. How an amazing example. What he's doing, as Jesus says, is highlighting this. He could have performed all of these things in quiet, but he does it in front of the multitudes that are following along. And he does it as a demonstration of the kind of faith that he's looking for his people to have. That Jesus will say later, I haven't even seen this kind of faith even in my own people. But the centurion had that kind of faith and a trust in God. He's not found such a faith. And I underline that in my Bible too, because this is what Jesus is after. At this moment, it's a faith lesson for the people, for his apostles to understand there is nothing impossible with Jesus Christ. And then at the very end, he highlights this as he talks about this. He says here, but the sons of the kingdom, you might have read that and wondered, what's he talking about? They're going to be cast out into outer darkness. Here he's referring back to the people who didn't have the faith in him. The sons of the kingdom is a reference to his own Jewish people who will, because of their rejection of Jesus, will be cast out. They don't have the faith that that man to know what Jesus was or who he was and what he was capable of doing. The authority that God had given to him. And then he turns back to the centurion and says, go your way. It'll be done just as you believed. Faith is so important in an individual's life. God is looking for us to trust him, to take care of him. He doesn't do everything we want him to do for us because many of the things that are going on or surrounding our life are designed by God to make us better Christians, to bring us closer to allow us to be more useful instruments in his hands. So our faith will be challenged by difficulties that come our way, just as this centurion encountered a, a dreadful situation of a special servant of his who was ill. And he took that matter to draw close to Jesus and demonstrated his faith. And Jesus is looking, you see, for our faith to be tested and to grow and, and to recognize even in our own lives that we need to put ourselves in Jesus' hands and recognize that with that, in God's will, he will do what is good for us. It doesn't mean, as we've said sometimes in answering prayers, that he's going to do everything we want. But consider as you are praying to God, to pray, Lord, take this situation and give me strength to know how to deal with it, how to grow from it, how to utilize that to make me a better servant. You see, and that's, in a sense, what the centurion did. did he, he took the situation and allowed it to challenge his faith and it drew him close to Jesus. We deal with a lot of things in our life, and this is something that's important. So as we're looking at all that's happening here, in both of these cases, faith was an essential ingredient in approaching Jesus. Humility and recognizing that Jesus had the answer. Too often we trust in our friends and suggestions and there are different things in life, and, and we want to seek out ideas and, and help and all. But make sure that we take that with a measurement of what is God looking to do? We may not always know, but if we'll go to him trusting him to let it to develop in its own time, we will actually reap a better reward and a stronger life in service to God. And that's what he wants from us. So allow God to put your faith to test. Pray to him for help when it's tested not to take away the things all the time, but rather, God, help me to learn from this, to be stronger by it, and 
In some cases, yes, please take it away. I, I pray for those things all the time, to heal, to take care of. I think of friends and people at Central and our mission works and all that. And my constant prayers are always offered up to do those things. But I realize in my life and the lives of others that people become better and stronger when they're tested. It makes faith a real faith. It puts sincerity in that faith. And that's what God's looking for in our lives. I hope your faith gets stronger as you go through life. I hope you're living close to him. And if you're not, you know you've got some help. If you want to give someone a call here at Central, we're all here to help out. Lots of Christians around. Reach out to one of them. On the other side of the coin, remember, too, that God is looking for us to demonstrate our love and our compassion toward people who are in need, like in the situation with the man who is a leper. And to recognize that those hurting people are waiting for some help and someone to touch them that Jesus can get in. And that's our job as a Christian. Think about those things. I hope that you have a great week and continue studying God's word and praying fervently that you'll be a better servant in so many ways. God bless. Have a great evening.